Ava Phoenix went to the U.S. when she was little, became a dentist, became a crypto millionaire. Then she lost everything. Then she moved to the island. And now she writes about, in her own words, having no job, rejecting social norms, and being a disappointment to my mom. But really, Ava is awesome. We had an amazing talk. We went very deep, very philosophical. We talked about living in the island, about how we can reject social norms, about being a golden girl or a golden boy when we're little. And really, this is one of the best episodes yet. So check it out with Ava. So Ava, how many languages do you speak actually now that? Two and a half. I speak Vietnamese and English and half of Spanish. I can I can talk. I say it's half because I can talk very well, but I cannot understand as well, especially here because people talk really fast. And I always have problem with listening, even in my own language and in English. Like if you play a song, I probably can catch like 70% of it even in like my own language. So it's been like a big challenge for me to understand and pick up Spanish when it comes to listening. Yeah. You? And you know, me, I, I speak a couple I, that I'm really confident in Portuguese, English, and Spanish. Thanks. I used to speak German because I lived there for a while, but now I'm not so confident because it's been a while since I, I've used it. And also a little bit of, of Italian. Yeah, I did. Wow. Yeah, I worked there okay. for a while and it was pretty cool. It was good experience to be able to travel a lot in Europe because it's so easy. It's so cheap. Like they have those 20 yeah. euro flights. Yeah. And... That's awesome. You're traveling a lot. I need to like, what are you, what's the secret? How are you getting out there so much? <laughs> I have a, a ton of secrets, really. It's just about budget traveling <laughs> and, you know, you can stay at hostels. You can do a lot of things for cheap. Mm. And sometimes you can find very cheap flights, even yeah. last minute, actually. Like the this last trip that I did, I bought it like two days before and I got a very yeah. cheap flight. Yeah, I think and... they, they really needed to put people in that flight. So. Mm, wow, that's cool. Well, sometimes, you know, I think sometimes things happen for a reason. You kind of, you got to take those chances when you get them. And yeah, I, you strike me as the guy who's just going to like take the chance and just do it without thinking too much about it, which is really cool. Yeah, when it comes to traveling, definitely I'm that kind of guy. Like, ever since I was a little kid, my dad was kind of like that. So I gotta, I mm. guess I got that from him. It's nice. But you know, I remember you writing about how when you were younger, you wanted to make a lot of money because at the end of the day, you actually didn't even really want to make money. You wanted to have some power because I, I read it somewhere that you wrote like i want to be a dentist to make a lot of money but i don't want to be just a dentist i want to do something else something great and how is that you know it's finally figured out what it is is complete child narcissism okay i grew up you know without any siblings and like i hang out with all of my cousins and i was the youngest one so there's always this sense of like i'm special and so and also my mom, you know, she, she, she tells me that too. She tells me all the time how special I am. So I grew up believing it. And I was like, I'm too special <laughs> to just be like a dentist. I need to do something else. But at the same time, I did not have any work um, ethnic. I wasn't mm -hmm. really the type of person who was very out of my comfort zone. I kind of grew up in like a bubble. Choosing dentistry seemed to me like a safe a stepping stone to get somewhere else also because uh, I'm from Vietnam and my family are like blue collar working class. So, we, you know, we don't really know how to make a lot of money. We don't really know how to be anything more than just like average. And so for me, it's like, I don't know how to do it. So I just be a dentist because studying has always been easy for me. So I just stay in school for as long as I could. And then, you know, later I just figure out how to use that money to like I thought I wanted to like invest in business and do all that stuff. And really, it was just wanting to make a lot of money, uh, <laughs> which I think it just rooted in the scarcity environment that, you know, I grew mm -hmm. up in. And for a lot of my, um, of the people I grew up around, 
um, they are unhappy in their life and they think that is due to the fact that they don't have a lot of money. So that was like kind of what I picked up growing up is like, oh, if you don't have money, then all of these problems are going to come to you. But, you know, obviously now I've like worked through all that and realized that it's not because you don't have money that just happens to be there. But all your problems come because you have problems within yourself that's, you know, manifesting outside into your physical world. But yeah. Dude, I still want to make a lot of money. It's just, it's just not like, it's something that now I want, I have to live with, but I don't want it to be like the, the, um, the deciding factor in anything that I do in my life anymore. So it's like, okay, we have that side of us who wants to make money and who wants to support our family and who wants to do fancy shit. But reality is none of that is going to solve our problems. So like, you know, how do we solve our problems? How do we get this and do this and live our life that's not control by money yeah and how do you see the differences between the mindset of people the ones that stayed in vietnam the ones that went somewhere else like you did yourself to america and of the people that you used to go to school with in america your friends like That's... how do you see the those mindset shifts it's like a really interesting conversation because i think about this every time i talk to my mom because, you know, from where I started, which is like, you know, in a very poor country, in a very poor area where I grew up, I was like among the kids who didn't even get to go to school. So like most of the kids in my neighborhood, they would like, you know, they're always dirty and they're always like uh, street playing with dirt and they would like have to go and sell like lottery tickets and like gum and stuff like that for their parents instead of going to school. And then my mom kind of raised me in like this bubble where... She always keeps me super clean. She doesn't let me go outside to play. Make sure I do really well in school. And she always, like, find the best school for me to be in. I can see that I went from that to coming to America and wanting to help her basically finish that dream. The dream of her coming out, you know, walking out of prob uh, poverty and being able to live a more comfortable life. For a long time, in like my younger years, I saw myself be really lucky to have that opportunity to continue my education and, you know, get my doctorate degree and build that life for myself and for my mom. But then at the same time, I think I got really lucky to the where I kind of, I guess I was like an alcoholic and I was like a really unhappy person, you know, even though I was like consider, you know, having a living a good life. So I think at some point it just kind of snapped and then I kind of get to see that phase that I was in the good life or the American dream that so many people dream to reach from in my country, in my background, or even that's, that's true for like, you know, anybody that's immigrating to the U.S. is to reach that American dream. And I guess for me, I was lucky because I was able to get there pretty straightforward. Didn't really have to try very hard. You just stay in school for like 10 years, 20 years, and then you're there. You know, I didn't work hard at all besides being in school. And after I reached that, I guess I, you know, I hit a place where I'm just like, what am I doing? Like, this is not enough. This is not like the life that I want. I haven't really done much other than just staying in my comfort zone. And so, um, you know, I moved to the island and I think that is like, a, a, so moving to the state was the first shift and then moving to the Puerto Rico is like kind of the second shift where um, to see that uh, for one, the dream of having enough to live and have our own survival meets need. Um, it was, was, I think it was more valid in my mom's generation where life was a lot harder. I mean, when she was born, mm -hmm. she was still like, you know, kind of just coming out of the Vietnam War and everything was very scarce. And it's like, you never know if you're going to make it another day kind of thing. Then by the time that I was growing up in the state, like things like that, you don't really worry about anymore. Like you see the, like, mm -hmm. the generation now, they don't really have to worry about if tomorrow they will have food to eat like that is i feel like our society is moving at a really fast pace where survival needs are just being met at like easier and more like more available for everybody so then i came to you know i came out here and then my mindset kind of just changed from like holy shit that's not enough like for our parents was that's all they could dream of because it took them so much and so long to reach that state of feeling secure but for us, we feel secure in those sense, like right away, like we are born in a very secure environment. If you're not in like a 
world tone, you know, country or like one of those very political areas, then you're say, you're, you have, you have water that comes to your sink. Well, like, you know, mm-hmm. you have electricity, you have everything at just like a snap of a finger and you don't think about it. And then, you know, you're, but you're still being taught by your parents that you need to keep making sure you get these things and have them. And I think that's why, you know, most of us just feel so purposeless and we don't know what we're supposed to do because we already have these things and our parents just wanted to keep working at the same thing. I think uh, it's an interesting conversation because I can see how my mindset has changed from being, from from basically feeling the way my mom did when she was growing up, being in that environment, to feeling like, oh, everything is good. Now I should just make a lot of money to realizing that, okay, making a lot of money is not even the end goal. That's not enough. We all want to evolve in a different way. So it's kind of like um, the prodigal son who goes mm-hmm. out there just to come back. Because it's really funny, my mom, because, you know, now once a week I come out to my friend's farm to do some farming. My mom, I would tell my mom about it, and she's like, you know, I work so hard to bring you to America so you don't have to farm, so you don't have to do hard labor <laughs> so that you can work in a nice AC office. So it's kind of just like, you know, like a full circle, right? Like my mom mm-hmm. is trying to get away from that farming life, from that tough, like you got to be out there in the sun working and stuff like that. She tried to get away from it. And then, you know, I kind of got there and now I'm going back to like, mom, I want to grow my own food. Like I want a homestead. I want to do these things because this is what you need to be doing. And, um, I think it's just like a constant evolution. And yeah, I kind of think like that's how I, that's how I kind of see like the out entire collective experience I, that's how i kind of see it's happening as well is that like at first we all come into the city for work for opportunity for you know in life and in a way it brings people together so that we can innovate these things we can make all this cool stuff build these things and now i think it's time for us to spread back out bring these technology with us but live like you know in a better environment because i think like Living in the city is getting weirder and weirder. Like, you know, you're so confined mm-hmm. in like a tiny concrete box. You don't see like any trees or any animals that are supposed to be living among you and always getting sick because you're just like always wearing your shoes. You're going from one place to another, always staying indoor. Like, I think that the city life served a purpose for the human species at a certain point. And now it's time for us to take all of that and spread out and take all of our knowledge and our technology and live in more harmony with, like, with nature. So I don't know if that answered the question. I kind of went on, like, attention there. But it's kind of like the shift that I'm seeing is for most people, it's like, you know, you're broke. You want to make a lot of money. You make a lot of money. Then you realize that you want to be happy. I think that's, like, kind of the sequence. So if you want to skip that and get there faster then maybe you take away the middle part where you think you have to make a lot of money before you can find like a meaning and purpose you know purpose in your life well i love that answer ava and i agree with pretty much everything you said and i think yeah there's a lot of going full circle in that story and you know maslow's hierarchy of needs as well and you know that pyramid and yeah and i think yeah, I think it's kind of hard. Like for the person that's on the first or second level of okay. that scale, it's kind of hard for them to look up to the fifth level. Like, yeah. oh, I maybe I don't need that much money in the first place because since you're on the scarcity mindset and you're thinking, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to eat dinner tonight because I need to make some money. I need to hustle. I need to do something. Okay. So I yeah. think... It's kind of hard. I think maybe you need to do what you did. Like you need to get to a certain level so you can go <laughs> back and say, yeah, no, maybe we yeah. don't need that much stuff. We don't need that much money. But I think you need to kind of get over that hump first, perhaps, because I see yeah. a lot of people here in Brazil, of course, there are a lot of people that they're so far away from getting over that hump that they yeah. can't even see that. You know, if you tell them yeah. something like that, you know, maybe you don't need as much money as you think. They'll be like, dude, I, I'm up, getting like, like yeah, like, fuck you. I, I need to get yeah. the bus three hours to go and three hours to come back and yeah. to work yeah. at a back-breaking job and make little money. But, yeah, but yeah like I, I totally get you. Is. Yeah, that's, how, that's, how my, that's where my family is, is, you know, they still feel like they constantly need to be chasing money. So they think, 
you know, when they, they say to my face all the time that, you know, I'm just living like this because I'm, I have the privilege of like not having to worry about you know, where my food comes from. But I think that it, it's just a matter of shifting the way that we think, because a lot of the time it's like for most of these people, it's not that they can't afford food. It's not that hard to buy food. Also, it's not that hard to grow food, like growing food. It's actually easier than finding a job and going to work and dealing with your coworkers and your bosses. Like growing food is like super easy, right? So it's not about survival need. It's about the fact that you think that all of your problems comes from the, the from from lack of money, which is not true. Any of the, of the problem that you have in your life, unless you're physically starving on the street, it's just inside. But none of us is taught how to look inside and find the root of our problem. And I think that's why we kind of use money as like the answer because it's easier for us to keep working and working and working than it is to like look back inside and realize that, okay, so I have been carrying all this drama in my life. I have been holding on to these beliefs that's not true. I have been doing all these things and it's really like, you know, nothing within me that if it can change, I can be completely happy. In Tolly, the guy who wrote the book on mm -hmm. the power of now, you know, he lived on the bench in the park for like two years and he was experiencing external bliss. So you cannot say that, you know, you need so much to be, you know, to be feeling happy. It's just that none of us were ever actually taught what happiness is. And I think it's because it's not profitable to teach people to be happy. It's mm -hmm. way more profitable for a society to have people constantly working and building things and innovating and, you know, making stuff than it is to have a bunch of people who just want to be outside sunbathing and looking at the plants and talking to the grass you know i mean that's basically was the hippies in the 60s and they shut that shit down fast like you know like they saw a bunch of people getting happy feeling enlightened and coming together as a community They're like fuck that shit we can't have people like that we can't run a society like that and then that's when you know they come in and they make like you know they make the whole hippie movement become this ridiculous thing and actually i heard from um watch this documentary that one of the guy who was the very first i forgot his name but basically he was saying that san francisco was the hub of this movement mm -hmm. of people you know doing shroom and coming together and living more in harmony with nature and you know just all of that and then he went on a tour to do like talk and speeches. And he came back like a few years later and the home place was just deserted with drugs. Like people were just, now they're just doing drugs. And, you know, the, the government are the people who make LSD. And I think that's what happened is, you know, they see this thing that's happening that might be a threat to the way things are going. And they just start pumping drugs on the street. They start, you know, Hollywood making hippies look like, dirty and crazy people who don't shower and eat weird shit. I think all of that was just to deter people from ever wanting to get down the road of becoming happy. Mm -hmm. Kind of went down a yeah. uh, rabbit hole there. It, and we, yeah, and you asked me before about kosher shifts, like of going to the U.S. And I think that one is a very big one because everything is so for profit. And yeah. so you have the whole food system, the whole healthcare system, and everything is intertwined. Like the whole, the same companies actually own the food and the yeah. healthcare and a bunch of other things. So like the company it's the whole that system. makes the food is also selling you medicine. So it's like, hmm, a good business model would be somehow to make people get sick from eating this food and then they have to buy all medicine. <laughs> Exactly. And, and they want to make you sick, but not so sick that you can die. It's a sickness that you can spend decades and decades alive, yes. but not completely healthy. So oh, Sick, but you can still weird. go to work. Yeah, you can still go to work. And, and it's crazy because they have so much space there. And, and if more people lived in those smaller towns and had, like you were talking about, like if you could grow a bit of your food, not maybe not everything, but yeah, just a little at bit. At least barley. Like <laughs> people could be so much healthier, and yeah, it, it's a very weird place in that sense. I think you have a lot of opportunity to make a lot of money, but at the same time, it's very sick, like mentally sick. Yeah, but it's it's by design, right? Like 
well, not yeah. to say that any specific, I don't think it's by design as in like, there's a group of people who sit there and be like, oh, let's make terrible plans for to kill the humans. But I think it just happens. It's exactly what happens when you just keep trying to make more and more money. Like that is like one of this, I think is the symptoms of chasing wealth and power. And maybe you kind of like, it was like that with like I can see that in dentistry as well like even in mm -hmm. you know in healthcare like um, I went to school I came out with like half a million dollars in debt the money that I was making was not going to be like people think that becoming a dentist make a lot of money but not anymore when you have so much debt and so you know you have this dream that you're gonna be living this fancy luxurious lifestyle and then you come out and then suddenly like third of your paycheck is going to the tax, is paying taxes, and then a third of your paycheck is paying off your debt, and then you don't really have much more money. And then, you know, you're going to have somebody come in and say, hey, if you sell more of this stuff, if you do more crowns instead of fillings, if you do this, mm. then you get paid more. And it's just like, I don't think anybody inherently have a bad intention to hurt people, but it's that craving of like, we need to make more money. I need to make more money because I work so hard. Why don't I deserve more money and i think that is kind of like it's just like there i don't think there is any limit to how far that is going to drag you and then you know the symptoms and the problems are just going to start piling up and piling up and piling up and like you said you come here you see everything is for profit and that's the exact reason why we have the society that we have now it's it's because people are just not having any regards for the consequences of the thing they're selling, the thing they're producing, the thing they're pushing. And it's just like, oh, you know, every company that you come in to work with, they're going to be like, okay, how do we make more profit? And then the person who can come up with the most brilliant plan to make the most profit gets rewarded. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't just get money, you get prestige, you get to be like a higher role, you get power. So it's, it's, it's so rooted to our system that, that, you know, we, we, we don't realize that that is hurting us and it's hurting us on like even the very, very small scale. Like just like, for example, being a content creator in content. But if you keep worrying about where your money is going to come from or where your follower, when your follower is going to come in, just slowly going to start making content that you think people want versus the content that you want. It's not just like, oh, I'm making what needs to be made so that I can make all this money. But I think slowly and slowly, it's like a ripple effect where you start being discontent with yourself. You're making more money, but you're less happy because you're not really being who you are. You're being somebody who makes all this money for, you know, for popularity and for wealth. And when you're unhappy with yourself, guess what? You're going to be in an unhappy relationship. If you have kids, your kids are going to grow up unhappy because that unhappiness is living inside of you. And then, you know, you just keep passing it on. Like, it's like, an unhappy person go everywhere and everyone he touches is going to be unhappy. And a happy person, everyone he touches is going to be happy. And so we just have this continual cycle of just, you know, passing on the same thing. That's where all of our problems come from is because we don't fucking know how to be happy. Yeah. And then a lot of people, they think, oh, I'll get the next big thing. I'll get more money. I'll get that car. I'll get, yeah. you know, there are many people that go traveling. I'm going to be a digital nomad now and <laughs> I'm going to live one month in every place. But the thing is, you take yourself everywhere you go. So if you're not ha happy by yourself, you won't be happy yeah. anywhere else. Yeah, really well said. Yeah, exactly. It's like if you can't be happy right here, you're not going to be happy anywhere else. I like how you said it. Like, of course, you need the basics. You need food. You need shelter. You need like to take a shower every now and then. But if you're not happy with that, if you're not yeah. able to be content with that, you yeah. won't be happy anywhere, yeah. really. But they'll just like grow some fucking potatoes and then you'll be fine. Like potatoes are easy to grow and you can eat it like a hundred different ways. They so, have all the nutrients. Yeah, like that is meant that everything else you do is just luxury. Like everything else that you do, like everything you buy at the store is just extra. And it's not like, oh, I need to do all these things. I already have food. I can just you know, do the things that I want to do now for the extra luxury that I want to be able to buy. But yeah, I am on a mission to get people to grow their own food. And you know, where did the whole meditating mango thing come from? It comes from me stealing mangoes all over the island. You know, mango is so crazy to me. Mangoes are like, people tree makes so much mango. They're like so many. 
and there are so many mango trees here and nobody eating them like they're selling mangoes at the grocery stores and people are buying mangoes in the grocery store and it just doesn't make any sense to me so you know at first it was just like seeing free food right like coming from the state nothing is free and i came to the island i was like oh my god free food no one's eating it at first i was just picking it on the ground because it's fell and then it still looks good and then you know i start picking it on the tree and then i start picking mm-hmm. it sometimes in people's backyards and it just you know it just start from there and i was like that was the very first thing I think that I um was the very first time that I start having this different connection with food. Where I realized that if you grow one tree, there is abundance for years and years and years to come, and it doesn't have mm-hmm. to cost so much money, and it's not sprayed with all kinds of fucking herbicides and chemicals on your food. Like this food is free and it's organic. Like can you get that anywhere else? And I think that was the beginning of my obsession with uh, starting to grow my own food. And then that combined with just, um, I started meditating and I started, everything starts with the uh, free the free mangoes and the meditation. And that's pretty much how I got here. That's where it comes from. And you've written about how people always ask you, how, how do I meditate and what should I do? And how do you meditate? Like, yeah. to someone starting with that meditation yeah. because we hear a lot of people saying, oh, you should meditate. It's super good for you. But yeah. why is it good for you and how does it work? And well, this is a really, this I'm very passionate about. So I'm probably going to talk for like 30 fucking minutes. Are you ready? Yeah, we're definitely ready. We love that kind of thing. Yeah, okay, well, so first thing I think that we have to realize is meditation is not woo. Meditation is not something that you can just like do a couple of times and then you're like, oh, I'm so enlightened and I can talk to the grass and I can see my past life. Like none of that has ever, ever happened to me. Like meditation to me is super practical, right? It's just kind of a chance for us to go down and just not have to constantly be moving because a lot, you know, all day long, our mind is moving and it's dragging our body with it, right? The reason why we always feel the need to do more and to have bigger dreams and to have more goals is because our mind is dragging our body with it in this loop of constant thinking. And so meditation, even when you sit down and you meditate and your mind is still going, you're basically telling your mind that, hey, you can be running, but you're going to be running in this specific spot where I'm going to sit Mm -hmm. and you're not taking me anywhere else. And so, you know, that's the first thing that we need to realize is just, we just, it's just a time to pause. A time to stop letting our mind dragging us everywhere. And the second thing is like uh, meditation is not going to bring you like any superpowers or any, um, you know, spiritual enlightenment. If that's what you're looking for, it's more like, well, I would say maybe not like that, but it's not going to bring you the answer. Like you won't meditate and just like, oh, I know everything now. It's more like a tool. Right. Um, I, I always think of it as like, I think so many people walk around and they're always trying to find like the right answer. Like, hey, what's the best thing I should do? My best diet. What should my best diet be? What should my best career be? Like, what's what all, uh, what should I believe in? You know, should I believe in God or should I believe in Buddha or should I believe in like something else or should I be an atheist? And so we just have so many of these answers and we keep looking for somebody to give it to us. I think meditation is kind of like the tool for us to just go back inside because the answers are there. It's kind of like, uh, use that analogy a lot of like, you know, walking around asking like, hey, what color is the sky? And then, you know, you have one mm-hmm. person say, oh, the sky is dark and gray. And then another person say, the sky is blue and pretty. And another person say, the sky is pink. Well, all of that is true, but the color of the sky just depends on where you are and when you're looking. At. And so meditation is actually basically just the act of looking up at the sky. Meditation is the act of stop running around and looking for these answers from other people because those answers are true for them in their specific background, in their specific life experience. It's not going to be true for you. You are so unique. Nobody has lived through the things that you've lived through. You have to look at look at the sky to find your own color. And, you know, that's what meditation is, is the practice of reminding you that all you have to do is look up. You don't have to keep running. So that's meditation. Um, do I meditate? So basically, a lot of 
what I use to help with my meditation comes from Buddhist practice and uh, specifically comes from Thich Nhat Hanh. He's basically like my spiritual mentor. Every time that I fall out of alignment or every time I'm feeling anxious or depressed, I would read his book or I would... Usually I feel that way because I have stopped reading his book or stopped watching his videos. And then that's when <laughs> I would remember to go back and, you know, learn from him. And so in, in Buddhism, the practice of meditation, it's just to observe. Observe your, there's four things that you focus on. So you observe your mind, you observe your body, then you observe the phenomenon, life, and you observe your feelings. So there's mind, body, feelings, and all dharma, which means all phenomena. So when I meditate, I would just sit and I would just, the very first thing you'd start is observing your breath because it's always there with you. So it's easy to just observe your breath. So, you know, breathing in, I know I'm breathing in, breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. And then you just kind of go like that and then you just keep following your breath and then you just sit there. And then a lot of time for me, even though I've been meditating for like two years now, um, I still have a lot of thoughts. Like I would sit there and I would observe my breath and then my thoughts will come in and then I would get caught up with it. Especially most of them are just ideas on how to make content. Either it will be like a newsletter that I'm writing in my head or it will be like a video that I'm like literally making in my head. And that's something that like I'm having a really hard time with is letting go of those things because I would sit there and I would meditate and I would have so many ideas and I would feel like, oh man, I have to remember them or I'm not going to remember them later. Like I get so attached to my ideas and that's like thing that I'm definitely struggling with. But yeah, so I just sit and I just observe my breath. And then when my, you know, when, when things come up, I kind of just tell myself that I need to let them go. And this is the time for me to just sit and in my body and think about um, just feeling what you're feeling. Like Buddha talks about, like, you know, feeling your posture, like being aware of your posture, aware of how you're making contact with what you're sitting on, like, you know, your sit bone and the two, two knees on the ground. So just feeling more so that we stop thinking because a lot of time when you ask someone like how do you feel they are telling you it's still what they think they're feeling like if you tell me like, mm -hmm. me like how do you feel i'll be like oh i think i feel tired today but maybe that's not even what i'm feeling that's just a label that i think fits what i'm mm -hmm. feeling but you know when you meditate so you don't try to label what you're feeling you kind of just just notice the emotions and the things that arise and I don't have a lot of time to do that anymore so that's why every time I can, I just sit and I try to meditate for like a couple minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, even like, like I said, like before I started this, uh, this call, I didn't see you because I was in the wrong link. So I just sat down and meditated and it's really just a chance for me to just like, okay, so we don't have to be anywhere right now. We're just right here. You just follow our breath. A lot of it, it's just, like just, you know, breathing in and breathing out and breathing in and breathing out. And it's, it's so simple. But it's also so profound because so many things arise when you're actually able to shut up the thinking part, you know, of your mind. Because the thinking or your mind is really, I call that like the nature, uh, not the culture self is the part that comes from our culture. Everything that we think, everything that we think is logical, everything that we think makes sense, every, every fact that we believe, all of that is, you know, our culture that we picked up. But our nature self, that's the part that digests our food, takes air in our body, keeps our heart beating. Like those things that we don't think about, but it's actually the very things that make us, that keeps us alive. And so I think that we all have this, I think that we all have the, the blueprint, everything that we need to understand why we're here and what we're doing. And it's the same way as our heart beating. It's all already there. But it's just that we never actually sit down and pay attention to the way our heart beats or the way our breath is coming in and our body. And that's why we're missing out on all of this blueprint of what we're supposed to be here for. And so, you know, that's why I like to meditate. You know, this reminded me of something I read. It might have been in some Eckhart Tolle book. And he was talking about one of those masters in meditation and everything. And they asked him, like, what should I do in in terms of like to be present and everything? Mm -hmm. And he, he said, just focus on your breath, 
for one year. Like every time that you remember this, <laughs> remember to focus on your breath again. Like if you do yeah. this for a whole year, every time, like, what am I doing? Oh, let's focus on my breath a little bit. Like if you yeah. do it for a whole year, you'll be able to be so more present that you will change your life. So this reminded me of that. That's that's exactly it. And actually, it was reading Eckhart Tolle and reading Thich Nhat Hanh that really pushed me down this path of realizing what I want to do, which is to and liberation. Which 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 sounds kind of woo woo, but it's it was so crazy because Eckhart Tolle is I think either Christian or Catholic, right? He's 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 not Buddhist. A lot of his teaching, he teach about what Jesus talked about and how it was misinterpreted. And then Thich Nhat Hanh, he's a Buddhist, but he so but they are both saying the exact same thing in different ways. Like when I read both of their books, it's everything is just like the same message, but on from two different like content creators talking about this very same thing. And that's when I realized why is it that way? Why is it that you know these people who are um in arguably the most happiest people that I know in in life, why are they all saying the same thing? And then I would watch um, Alan Watts and then like Sat Guru, and, you know, I would read uh, books about um, Jesus as well as Buddha. And I realized that everybody is saying the same thing. It's not a debate. It's just, you know, how you're interpreting it that perhaps, you know, you're just, just seeing like um, the different messages, just like Mm -hmm. Like how, um, you know, somebody said the sky is pink versus the sky is blue. It's all the truth. But the point is, I think every religion and every spiritual re leader or spiritual teacher is trying to just teach us to look up, do the work yourself, stop looking for answers. It's only when you're looking for answers that you get into these crazy arguments with people because everybody has a different answer. But, you know, like in, in Christianity, like there's, Praying. praying is an act of meditation. It's an act of coming back into mm -hmm. yourself. And in Buddhism, it's the same thing. It's like they don't tell you what is the truth. They just tell you these things to do. If you do it, you will find the truth for yourself. And, and yeah, and so now that's what my life is. is trying to find that truth by just doing the practice. But it's taking a really long time because I'm still a product of my environment. Yeah, as you were talking about this, I was asking myself, what are your thoughts on you know, those woo-woo stuff that people talk about, the law of attraction and that you can manifest things. What are your thoughts on that? Because I know you are you are also very rooted in like physical reality. Yeah. And you've For studied sure. a lot of things, like being a dentist and everything. You know a lot about this as well. So what are your thoughts on that kind of thing? I think that there's truth in it, but again, it's it's kind of like religion where, you know, some there's some truth, but people are taking it you know, perhaps for some type of personal agenda. And so it turns into like, because the people who are saying that, oh, change your life with just this thing and that thing, at the end of the day, they are just there doing that either for recognition or for wealth. They're trying to build a following. They're trying to have people, you know, subscribe to their things or they're trying to be a, a, a spiritual coach or they're trying to make money. And that's where it, that's where it all comes from is, People who have found maybe like a half truth or maybe they have found a taste of the truth and they, then they start getting pulled by, you know, their cravings, like the wealth, the recognition, the profits. And then, you know, it becomes a little bit more predatory, like trying to like, how do I blow this up so it gain more attention kind of thing. Um, thing uh, with manifestation and all of that, it is truth in that in the sense that like you're physical reality oh, there is not one like there is not one world that we live in there are limited unlimited right there are unlimited worlds it, it's on one planet but like your world is nothing like my world your experience every day is completely different than mine and you know and so, or somebody who's involved in like politics somebody who believes in democrats versus somebody who believes in the republicans like their worlds are completely different and so Mm -hmm. It's like we have this collective world, but each one of us only has the power to choose like a slice of it that's going to be ours. That's going to be the world that we experience in this lifetime. So how we think, how we how we basically curate that world up to us, like how I curate my world now 
is completely different than how where my where I was like say three years ago. Like now, I spend most of my time in the mountains. I don't watch TV. I don't really know what's going on in like the pop culture or politics. I don't even listen to music. So like my world now is like kind of like a whole different thing. But I spend a lot of time in nature. I learn a lot about plants and about growing. But before it was like you know I I was more involved with all these things. So then I would meet people who like to talk about politics, or I will meet people who like to talk about business and making money. But now I meet people who like to grow stuff. Then I meet more people who like to eat uh, food that they grow. I meet people who like to do other things. So now my world is literally shifting from one to another. I think, you know, in a way, that is what manifestation is, right? It's realizing what you want and then kind of choosing to see those things and follow those things so that you can curate environment that is full of the things that you want. But I don't think it's the same thing as like, oh, if I could just sit here and imagine a thousand, a million dollars, that in a few years, a million dollars gonna fall in my lap. And I don't think that if you just mm -hmm. sit here and I can just imagine that I'm the most confident and well-spoken person in the world that a few years from now, that is going to fall in my lap. I think the idea of manifestation is to visualize what you want so that you put in your consciousness that, okay, I want to be more confident. And then from there, you kind of just slowly start seeing ways for you to achieve it. Like, oh, maybe I should pay attention to this person. You know, he's a confident guy. I want to be around him more so I can learn from him. Or maybe I should read this guy's book. So I think that's what that visualization is. And that's what manifestation is, is, deciding for yourself what you want to curate this world that you live in. And then from there, you start noticing things that will come in your path. And then you take up on those opportunities and then you make that happen. But it's not, I don't think it could be anything ever of just like, I would just manifest and do nothing else. And I just sit in a room and manifest all day. And then one day it's just going to happen. I think it's just like, you know, being here, what you want. I think that, I was thinking about this the other day, but I was just thinking about how all have the power to make everything that we want happen. Like, if you think about it, people, you might think that, oh, I'm not happy with where I am right now. And I ha I'm not happy with this aspect in my life or this person in my life. But at some point, this is exactly what you wanted before. It's mm -hmm. just now you get it. And then you realize that it's no longer what you want. But that speaks to the power that we all have to get what we want in this life because that's all that we do. We decide what we want and then, you know, it happens. It's the same thing as like airplanes being made, right? Two guys decided that they want to travel in the freaking air. And then from there, they make that happen. And you could call that manifestation. And that exactly is what it is. This entire world is just a bunch of people manifesting what they want in their head. And so we all have that power. And I think that if we just believe that as long as we know what we want, that eventually it's going to happen, then it will be a lot easier because it is true. When you know that that's what you want, eventually you're just going to find ways to do it. It's not going to just happen, but brain is going to bring it to you. Just like, you know, you're craving something and eventually you're going to find a way to get that and eat it and feel good. And then and maybe you decide that's not what you want anymore. And then you just start a journey all over. And I think that that's all that life is, is. You know, the journey of figuring out what we want and doing it and then see where we go from there. Yeah, you know, I think there are so many threads that we can pick from that. I think in a way, manifestation, if you think like an engineer thinking about a building before it exists and then they make the project mm -hmm. and then other people build this. So it's kind of, you have this grand idea, but you have a bunch of steps that you have to take to mm -hmm. get there. It's yeah. not like magical because that's right. just magical thinking if you're thinking mm -hmm. just, oh, it's just going to happen. But at the same time, you mentioned praying, for example, and maybe you're praying, I don't know, maybe you want to get a new job or something. You're it's you're kind of visualizing that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you weren't, if you didn't have that intention, if you're not consciously setting an intention, maybe you wouldn't notice that I don't know, maybe there's a friend of yours who works at a company that you might want to work with as well, or maybe, you know, those little opportunities that happen in life and sometimes we don't even notice. 
But when we're visualizing it and we're paying attention to things, because I think it boils down to that at the end of the day, when you're paying attention, then you'll start seeing the things and then yeah. you'll be able to go get them. And there was another thing that you mentioned now, and I really want to talk about, but I forgot about it. Uh, this is about food, about what we want. Uh, no, it was about station. what you were talking about now. And I, I totally forgot, but it was golden as well. But yeah, anyways. I agree. I think that, you know, basically everything is up for grabs. And we just have to tell our brain what it's supposed to see, right? Because you know that, you know, scientifically also like there are inputs that happens around you every day that your brain decides that it just doesn't have the capacity to keep it in the consciousness. So you ignore it. And that's how you don't notice the little things like on the side of the road, or you don't think about when you're driving home and how do you get to your house? It kind of just happened. It's basically, mm -hmm. you know, your brain putting all of these millions of stimuli that's coming at you all the time kind of in the background so that it figure out so it can serve you to figure out the thing that you want to do the most and so that's what visualization or intention or any of that is it's telling your brain hey i want you to start paying attention to this because this is what i want and you know we're gonna get there somehow but you have to start you have to start putting that in the background and start you know maybe moving mm -hmm. into the focus of my attention yeah that's exactly what it was getting yeah. into about thinking about how actually sometimes we think things happen like well, they just happen but actually subconsciously you wanted that mm -hmm. maybe yeah like if someone has a bad partner or a bad job subconsciously they kind of in the background they think i i'm not worth more than this so yeah. you kind of put yourself in that situation subconsciously that's why you need to shed light into what's in mm -hmm. the background yeah. And meditation is one of the things you can use, of course, and try to take that out and say, like, maybe that doesn't work for me. It doesn't make sense. Uh -huh. Like, maybe someone said something when I was five years old and it's in my background yeah. and I don't need that yeah. anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, um, I just forgot what I wanted to say. I like, you know, so basically, that's why the more that you understand yourself, the better of an experience you're going to get because it's basically like having a genie who asks you, okay, what do you want? And if you don't understand yourself, you're going to say a bunch of stupid shit that doesn't even serve you in any way. Right. And then that's what you're going to get. And then that's when you get in this place where you're like, what's going on? Like, I think that's what a, a midlife crisis or a quarter life crisis is, is, you know, chasing mm -hmm. the, or asking or chasing for things that we think we want, but that's only because we don't truly know what it is that, we want we don't understand ourselves and it's normal like when i say like we don't understand ourselves like there's no negative notation to that at all we are all raised to be externally driven you know we're all raised in it, it like we're raised to listen to our parents or to be do well in school or to get jobs and to have careers and very very few of us have the fortune to be raised with parents who are self-aware and so if our parents are not self-aware, mm -hmm. we're not going to be self-aware. And so being raised this way is normal. Like not understanding yourself is a very normal experience that we all have. And then from there, I think that's where we start. And then we have to study and learn about ourselves more. Because if you know that you can ask for anything that you want, then it's not going to happen right away. It might take 10 years or 20 years. Then you better make sure mm -hmm. that you're asking for the thing that you really want so that you don't waste those 10, 20 years chasing the wrong thing. Yeah, and I think another thing that it's important to do is to periodically, and the more you do it, of course, you can't all the time be thinking about it, but like once a week at least, think about your goals and what you really want and what am I going to do this week, this month to do. Like, of course, there will be ups and downs. There, You won't, like no one's perfect and everything. And sometimes you'll just figure out, maybe I don't really want that. I thought I mm -hmm. wanted that and I'll have to change my goals. But, you know, having this periodically thinking about what you want and what you want to achieve, because otherwise you kind of go this way and then you go that way and you really don't achieve anything. Yeah, a really good rule of thumb. This is what I learned from um, Ted Nyakan is to ask ourselves, you know, like you say, periodically, if the thing that we're chasing after, is it our craving, which is, you know, wealth, recognition or sex? Or is it out of 
love and compassion because most of us, we start wanting to do something out of love and compassion, but then we get distracted because our society doesn't operate on that frequency. Our society operates mm -hmm. on wealth and fame and recognition and sex. I mean, that's the truth. Like Hollywood, movies, TV show, everything. Like that's all that you get. So, you know, we always, we most of us start with this intention of, you know, maybe to support our family or to take care of somebody or it's always out of love and compassion and then we get distracted. So we always have to come back and ask, okay, are we going down this path? Because it's still, you know, the original plan of like going for love and compassion or are we getting distracted? You know, this is in like every single teaching. It's clear that you run after wealth and sex and money you're, you're just not going to be happy. Like it's not going to bring you fulfillment. It could be a good tool to do many things, but it's so double edged that it can also stab you kind of a way where it stops pulling you and you don't notice it and it stops hurting you instead. Oh yeah. So like you said, we have to keep asking ourselves because at the end of the day, what do we want? We want to be happy. We want to be loved. We want to be having intimate experiences sharing intimate experiences with other people in our lives all of that is love and compassion that's all that we want ultimately so if we just make sure that we're doing things out of that nay feeling of love and compassion then we will always get what we want so it's always just a matter of like you know making sure that all of that distraction from the society from the external environment it's just not getting to us and what do you think about that fear of not being or of not doing enough I think it's very valid and um, that's something that I'm also working through right now because I think that that fear comes from a place of fully 100% accepting ourselves. If we truly accept ourselves like a high capacity, then we would see that that is not true. But whether it is, um, whether that fear how strong that fear has a hold on us really depends on how much ourselves we are actually in tune with and we are actually accepting. For me, it's like right now, it's just an idea. Right? It's just an idea that like when you hear people say, I have hard enough, you are good right here. Like all of that is true, but it's also just an idea and you have to do the work to turn that mm -hmm. idea into your truth. Like you have to internalize it. It's like me telling you that elephant exists and it's the most gorgeous animal in the world. And you might see pictures of it and you might believe believe me and you've seen the pictures, but you have to do the work to getting out there to be in the presence of that elephant, to truly feel what it's like to be, you know, next to something that majestic, for example. And so I think, you know, with the idea of like, oh, you are enough and all of that. It's just an idea until you put in the work to turn that idea into your reality. And I think that so many, in, there are so many ways that we don't accept ourselves because there are so many ways that people in our life don't accept themselves. And then they project that onto us and we project it onto them. It's like, a, you know, it's like a way mirror, right? Like we project out there what's inside us and they we take in what the collective is giving to us. And so um, I think that is a, it's kind of like a flu that passes around, right? Everybody has a case of it. Somebody mm -hmm. has it better. Somebody has it worse, but we all have it. And at the end of the day, no, like I'm saying this because I know it intellectually, but I haven't turned it into like a, an actualization within myself. But I know that I feel that way because I have not yet reached the point where I can see that I am more than just myself. Like um, Buddhism, there's something called um, pendant, called arising, um, mm -hmm. for being, um, which just means that everything exists within everything else, that nothing has, nothing is a separate self. Like, a, it's not like, not made up of a million little you in there, in your body. <laughs> or made up of water, of sunlight, of minerals from the soil, of the food that you eat, of all of these things that makes up the whole cosmos. And that's mm -hmm. you. And that's also me. So you and me, you and I are not very different. And I'm not very different from, say, like a cup of tea. A cup of tea is not going to be a cup of tea if there was no sunlight to grow the tea or if there was no rain to water the, the tea plant. 
or if there was no person who turned that hand into a tea for me to drink. So that cup of tea holds so much more than just a cup of tea in it. I think that if I can eventually get to the point where I can internalize all of that and realize that I'm not just Ava, but you know, I am in the tree and the tree's in me and I'm out I'm I'm in every part of everything that makes up the world. It is the same thing that makes up me, which scientifically is also true. It's not just a spiritual idea, right? Like mm -hmm. the primordial soup, where does that soup come from that make the very first bacteria in the ocean, right? That comes from the atmosphere. That comes from carbon, from nitrogen, from oxygen. All of that are the same thing that makes up the stuff that's out there in the sky, in the galaxy. So all of that is a truth that we have all forgotten. That is why we think that we are not enough because we don't see that the thing that is inside of us is also the same thing that's in everything else that we call life. And so I think, you know, it's just something that we each have to, the journey down into realizing that. And I think for some people, it takes many lifetimes to realize that. And so I don't even know how many lifetimes that I've been going down this journey to just get here, you know, and I don't know how many more lifetimes I'm going to have to keep going. But in Buddhism, there's you know, a Buddhist, I mean, Buddha is just the person who realizes all of this through, not through anybody's teaching, but just through studying himself and meditating. One day he realized that he is not separate from any of the things around him. And that's basically how he escaped the cycle of life and death. And the Buddha teaches that, you know, all of us, we are in the cycle of life and death and we just keep coming in and out that cycle the same way that your breath comes and go. One breath dies and another breath is born. It's like that. We are just born. Sometimes we're born as a tree. Sometimes we're born as a rock. Sometimes we're as a bird. And the whole, the whole cycle just keep repeating until we can escape that cycle. And we escape. We get out of that cycle of life and death. And then, you know, I think that's when we realize that don't really ever die. Just go back in the soil to be alive as something else after that. Like, that's what's next for us. And I think that there is great uh, bliss. And I think it is a profound experience. And, uh, and it's something that I want to, at some lifetime, be able to reach. That's awesome. Do you think that humanity has a sort of a narcissistic complex and about just uh, like... For sure. For sure. Like, you know, like we are like humans as a species. We pride ourselves on like the technology that we innovate, like, you know, all the things that we have built. But like, if you look at our solar panel, the thing that we use to capture sunlight to turn into energy, they're like fucking ginormous. Have you seen a leaf? A leaf is this <laughs> tiny thing that is also taking in sunlight to turn into energy, which then turns into food. Actually, a piece of leaf is way better than any of the solar panel that we have built. But, you know, we all, we definitely have that complex where we think that, oh my God, we have built all these things and we can do all of this stuff. And it's amazing. And in a way, it, I'm not saying that it's not because it is amazing. Like it's, a, it's such an amazing time to be alive right now. You know, to be able to travel everywhere without mm -hmm. having to be like a millionaire to do it, to be able to get information from every corner of the world if you just are looking for it. I think it's an amazing time to be alive. But I also think that it can be better if we can integrate the technology we have built with the ancient wisdom that has always been there. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that that is the next step in our evolution. Is taking all of this and kind of like bringing it back home and integrating it. And yeah. Yeah, I agree too. I think, and there's a good movement now because you talked about homesteading in the beginning, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and many people in, in our generation talk about that, and oh. many, of course, haven't been able to do it yet. But many people, I have some friends that talk about maybe we should get a farm together and you know <laughs> have like a little village and, mm -hmm. and yeah. grow food and animals and that kind of thing and i think of course there's a bit of an idyllic trying to look at things from an idyllic view when mm -hmm. you live in a big city 
But at the same time, like we said in the beginning as well, like big cities are kind of sick because you're living in a mm. cramped up apartment and you don't yeah. really like maybe if you're lucky, you'll go to a park in the weekend mm. and that's about <laughs> it. And, and it's very unnatural how we live and you barely walk and you you eat bad food. So, hey, so it's shitty. very unnatural. The year is shitty. Yeah. And it's too crowded, too many people. Yeah. And mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's interesting to think about that and how we could integrate and have this movement of going more towards the countryside or towards the beach, the yeah. mountains and, and living like trying to be actually like, because we see a lot of people who they say, oh, you shouldn't eat meat or you shouldn't do that because that's like your carbon footprint. It's terrible because you're importing fruit from all over the world and whatever it is. But if you actually do your own s- stuff, you know, you yeah. plant <laughs> some of your whole f- uh, your own food and you have your own chickens and stuff, like, what's the carbon footprint there? It's, it's negligible. I went through exact thing that you're talking about when I came out here to the island and I started being a little bit more conscious of, like, my presence here, my footprint and all that stuff. I hit a point where I was just paralyzed because everybody is like, you know, somebody's like, you shouldn't use this. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't eat meat. Or, and then some guys like, you should eat meat. And then someone's like, you should not eat beans. They have anti-nutrients in there. You shouldn't eat this. There's just like so many fucking contrasting opinions that like, I didn't, I, I don't even know how to exist properly anymore. I'm like, what do I do? Like, how do I exist now? Everything feels wrong. And I think that that's what we are feeling a lot as generation and Gen Z. And I think that's why there are so many problems that is arising from that is because we are literally paralyzed and we are always being constantly told that what we're doing is wrong or what we're doing Mm -hmm. is not good enough. And the reason I realize now that we feel like that is because we're just not doing the right thing enough like it's not like there's one right thing it's just one little thing and one little thing and one little thing that you do that yeah i i kind of want to take that back i don't want to say the right thing but i think that we're not taking action for ourselves enough like if you're just sitting here and you really really want to change the world and you really want everybody to be happy and living in harmony but you're continuing to participate in the system that is the very opposite of then you're going to feel really, really shitty. You're going to feel bad to the point where you either have to numb yourself, self-medicate, or, you know, you're just going to shut down. And that's kind of what happened to me. And I see that happening to, like, my cousins as young as, like, 16, 17 years old. You know, they're Mm -hmm. already so outspoken about the unfairness of the world, the problems and you know, their stand on a portion versus not, or all of these, they, are, they feel so strongly about it. And they, they, they actually are very emotionally invested in it. But then at the same time, mm-hmm. what are they doing? They're fucking strolling TikTok 20 hours a day talking about it. <laughs> like, that's why you feel like shit, because you're just talking about it. You just have to start doing one thing that will empower you. And then you do the second thing and then the third thing. Like now, if you tell me like, oh, you know, Ava, you shouldn't do that. Like, that is not good. Like, shouldn't eat meat. Be like, I don't care because I'm eating meat and I'm not, I'm not eating shitty meat. I'm eating like good meat that I, from, I'm buying from farmers that I am friends with, that I know, I know how they feed them. And like, I'm doing enough in my life where I have the confidence that I'm doing has a, some positive. Of course, there's going to be negative and of course, there's going to be positive. But now I know that it's always a sum positive so that it doesn't really concern me. I'm always trying to do more so that I can make the sum positive bigger. But at the same time, Mm -hmm. I know it's impossible to eliminate like the negative, right? Because I still want to fly on an airplane that make all of this fucking ever that they release in the air i don't know but i know that i still want to fly home to see my family and i still want to come back out here i'm not going to stop doing that but what i could start doing is i could start growing my own food i could start making my own soap i could start you know making my own makeup stuff like doing all these things empower me and give me the confidence that that i am doing something to offset the other things i'm doing and so do you know santi mm, not sure 
Okay, so this is my, my friend. Uh, he has followed me for like a really long time since like my early Twitter day. He said to me recently that like your writing doesn't sound as angry as it used to be. And that is like <laughs> literally my evolution. You know, like I think we all go through that phase where we kind of have like this wake up moment where we realize so many things are going wrong. And then we have this angry moment where we realize that so many things are going wrong and there are so little that we can do about it. And then the next moment, it's just doing little by little and then finding peace in that, realizing that, oh, if I just do this part, I do feel a lot better. And those problems still exist, but in my life, they don't, they don't exist in my life anymore. And if everybody just do a little bit to make their life the way that they want it to be, problem will slowly disintegrate itself because this is not something like everything that we've talked about in our society, like, you know, in this entire call. It's not something that one person is going to solve, right? It's just something mm -hmm. that we each do a little bit of, and then it evolves kind of on, on, on its own, you know, just like the cells in your body. Like say you have a huge wound, there's not one cell that's going to say, okay, everybody, now we need to do all this, and we, <laughs> I will be the one who patch up this wound in the stomach. Like that's not how it works, you know, like there are just signals that tell this cell that is, you know, replicating like normal that, okay, maybe now I need to make a little bit more of this. Maybe now that I need to shut off this part of the DNA and express the other part so that I can do this. This is a signal. This is what I'm going to do. I don't know what that other guy is going to do. I'm just going to do my part. And I think all of us are just individual cells who just need to realize that we just need to do what's right for us. And that would be what's right for, you know, our society and for the, for the world. And I think that's how we get out of being so fucking angry. I, I see a lot of people who are angry and I understand it. But at the same time, it's just like so easy to just cook your own food. Like I, that for me was the first step. It's just cooking. I'm still buying stuff from the grocery store, but at least I'm cooking and I'm not eating out. And, you know, you, you start from there and inherently will want to do more. You don't have it. You don't even have to force yourself to do more. Once you start seeing like how good that feels, you're just going to seek more ways to do more of it because all of us inherently all want to do the right thing because doing the right thing makes us feel good. Like at the end of the day, that's what it is. You can argue that, oh, I have to do this and that to make more money and whatever, but we all know that being sketchy things and, you know, being like really self-serving and not thinking about other people or acting not out of compassion, not out of love. We all know it doesn't make us feel good at the end of the day. And we all want to feel good. So, you know, we naturally gravitate to doing the right things. If we just create the conditions to ourselves, kind of like do it. it, it that's why like even now I don't appreciate like, you know, all the movements that's going on in the climate change and all that stuff. But I would appreciate a lot more like, you know, we, we talk about all oh, the plastic that say the company like Coca-Cola, they're making like insane amount of plastic well they wouldn't be making that if nobody is buying it like if, if mm -hmm. we don't have to change any policy you don't have to go to the white house and you don't have to fight you just if we just stop buying stuff then then what is going to happen like it's kind of scary like the capitalist nature of like all these corporations and all of these uh companies that are so powerful now but at the same time, it's kind of assuring to know that their power comes from us giving it to them. Like if we just stop participating, if we stop buying soda, all the soda companies are going to die. If we stop buying like bottled water, then all of the people selling bottled water is not going to make it. So it's like we have all of the power to change all of it without having to like, you know, march down like DC and scream and fight and be in so much agony. And it's not that... um it's a bad thing that people are doing that. I appreciate people who are doing it, but I think that if we do it out of anger, and I don't think that it is sustainable. I think that we have to do it in a mm -hmm. way that makes us feel good. Like we, you don't have to be in agony to save the world. Like you can be happy, and that's the fastest way to save the world. Like you know, like when you're around a happy person, you you just feel happy naturally. And then when you feel happy, like things that you can do, the things that you can imagine is like endless. Like all you have to do is just be happy and then the world will change. Love this. I love this. And yeah, I think when you are doing the right things in your life and it's uh, it's all about what we were talking before as well. Like 
when you change the lens through which you see the world, things look better. Like if you put yeah. rose tinted glasses, yeah. the world looks great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like there are good things, there are bad things, but there are also good things. And I think I used to be trapped in the mindset of like, oh, if I'm not tuning into the bad things and I don't, then it's kind of like digging my head in the sand. I don't know what's going on mm -hmm. and I, I, it's not um, realistic. I had to know what's going on. I had to be aware of the problems in order to solve or fix the problem. That's how I used to think and that's how I used to force myself to keep up with like the news and the politics and all of that. But the truth is it was way more damaging than it was helping because, okay, if I know that there's these crazy things happening in the politics, what exactly am I you need to do about it. Like, what the fuck did mm -hmm. I do? Like, I, I'm aware of it. And then what? I'm going to make a post on Instagram and talk about it on TikTok. And then what? The thing is actually going to change. And it's because we have this desire and we have to, we have this belief that to make any change, it has to be like so grand and so up there and so out there. I think that um, now I am at peace with not ever keeping up with those things anymore. And my reality now is more rosy than ever it's like a rose color everything is good and everything is true and it feels great people might say oh you know you can't just live like that because then you don't know what's going on but at the same time when I'm around them I'm happy and I'm, I feel good and I make them feel happy and I make them feel good and so I think that to me is like the more important most immediate effect that I could bring as a person to anybody that I come in contact with because realistically I am just never going to change the policy in the fucking White House like I don't know how and I mm -hmm. don't want to do it I fucking hate politics and, you know I don't also want to be like constantly fighting against these against these like giant powers and feeling powerless and feeling like I always have to fight I think that once you have to enter a fight you're already losing you're both losing I don't think the answer is fighting I don't think the answer is solving the problem I think the answer is creating conditions where the problem just can't survive, like creating conditions that problems don't arise. These problems will not arise if people are happy. And how can I make other people happy by first being happy and then help them be happy? Because honestly, I think the world is so fucked up because it's just everybody's unhappy. You know, like people, I can't imagine that like Kamala Harris or Trump right now are very happy people. Like, you know, yeah. like you see what's going on in their life and like you can just look at somebody and it's like, I'm not happy and that sucks. And if they were happy, I bet that we would have a completely, completely different political like world that, you know, that's happening. And I think that's all that it is. You, yeah, like it's so simple and I can't believe it took me so long to realize it. Yeah, I think it, it has to do, like you said, with doing the little things that we can control, like Many times we were thinking, oh, like we mentioned climate change, but have you ever planted a tree? Like yeah, a basic yeah, thing. Exactly. And yeah. most people will say no. So yeah. Yeah, if you just... never did any of those basic things and also like picking fruit from a tree as well, like yeah. if you never did that as well, like what are you talking about? I do think that it's the good start. Right. Like at least it's the awareness that things need to change. Like we're at that place. But I also just think like we just weren't really equipped with answer, like finding the answer. Like if you think about the previous generations, like for so long, humans as a species have just been so obsessed with civilization and building bigger and faster and better things. Like that's what we've been obsessed with for so long. And I think, so I think that yes. In a way, there are more that we could do, but at the same time, I feel proud of how far we've gone as like a generation, like our generation, Gen Z or whatever, like the young people. I am impressed at how aware they are of the things that are going wrong. It's just now they don't know how to actually fix it, at least, but at least they know the problem. Now, I think they just need some guidance on how to actually, you know, fix it in a way that makes them feel good because being aware of the problems and not having solution is really what making everybody feeling so stressed and anxious and depressed is because they are now suddenly made aware of like millions of problems that our parents didn't have to think about. Like our parents don't believe that depression exists. Like my mom would just be like, shut up and go to work. 
then you feel better. You know, like stop fucking crying. Like, you know, like that's how our parents operated. And so now it's just like suddenly we are met, like we're made aware of so many problems with ourselves, with our environment, with our politicians, you know, with um our everything. Like we are aware of these problems, but we are not given solutions. And that's why we feel so shitty. And that's why life feels so hard all the time. So I forgot where I was going with that. But I think it's all the same thing I have been saying for an hour. Yeah, you know, you wrote about going on a date with your younger self. And since we're talking about people from a generation a little bit younger than us, and, you know, people are maybe 15, 18, 20 years old now. And may, like growing up, like even in our generation, there was a lot of negativity, like like we've mm. been talking about for the last few minutes. Mm. But I think we kind of lose sight that we're living in such an awesome time to be alive. Like okay. if you compare it to most of humankind in mm. this world, we're living in probably the best time ever. And, oh. uh, like if you could go back to what you wrote in in that piece about going to going out with your younger self and mm -hmm. finding purpose and finding joy? Um, oh. Wait, I just lost my train of thought real quick. Thinking, loading, or not. And, <laughs> um, I think it really, it, yeah, I agree. It's such an awesome time for us to be alive right now. I think that it is by design that we don't see it. I mean, if you turn on the news, you don't see good news. You don't you don't find good news on the news. The news is just all bad news. They just they should just call it bad news channel. Like it's not the news because it's not neutral and there's no good news. It's literally all bad news. Um yeah, so going back to my younger self, I'm not sure if I know what you mean by that. Like what would I tell my younger self or how would I see things yeah. differently or Yeah, like like, you know, you wrote about that and about your conversation with her that you had yeah. in your mind and that you wrote. Yeah. yeah so if yeah. you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I think that it, I have just gone through so many, I guess, um, if in my life where I changed so much that like look back now and I just, you know, I just feel that uh, when I was young, I was also very certain of myself. I was sure that I was meant to be a city girl. I was sure that I wanted to, you know, work like in Wall Street and wear fucking high heels all day, every day. And I was sure that I wanted this luxurious like life. And so I think that's why I think about that version of myself a lot because I realized that it's so possible for you to be sure of something and it's so possible for you to be wrong about it in the best way because then, you know, change is like, um, change is possible and i think it's just now my philosophy is you can be sure of everything but just leave a five percent of who knows because mm -hmm. it, that five percent can open up so many different possibilities and different uh just it it, it could change your whole life just that five percent and like for example i used to say i hate camping and now i'm sleeping in the dirt like once a week every single week Right. And, and so it's just like if you decide for yourself so early on that you know what you like and what you don't like and what you hate and what you love, you're going to uh, out on a lot of things. And there was like one thing that, you know, I could say to myself, my younger self would probably be, uh, don't be sure of anything. Just stop being so sure of yourself. <laughs> Like in some way it's good, but in many ways it's like it's stopping you from 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 reaching these experiences that you can't even imagine. Because at the end of the day, that's where we want to go, right? We want to keep going to places that we haven't been to, that we can't imagine. We don't want to just keep going to the same place over and over again. But then we're always trying to plan out our whole entire life, which is what I did when I was younger, plan out my whole life. But if you can plan that life, then you're just living in the past. You have to plan a life where you can't even plan it. Like that's the life that you mm -hmm. should plan for. And that's how you live for the future. That's how you live for the best things in life to come to you. One thing about my younger self is I always have this 
always watch people talk about um, crazy kind of like um, coincidences or synchronicity, like crazy things happen to me. Like I can't believe like I went on an airplane and I met this guy and he ends up to be like the CEO of this company, exactly what I want to be doing. And then we connect it and then, mm-hmm. you know, we build this awesome thing. And I was always like, why doesn't that happen to me? I always wonder that. I was always wonder like, why doesn't something like, out of the blue and extraordinary kind of thing ever happened to me like you know like why don't i go to a fucking grocery store and just meet the love of my life there like why doesn't that happen either <laughs> right like how come these things never happened to me and now i finally found the answer is because i was a freak at planning my life because i was planning my life and i always wanted to live within the parameters of what i plan of course there's no room for expected things to come into my life mm-hmm. And you know that's the that's the that's the reason why is because you keep wanting to go where you think you should go, but if you're thinking of where you should go, then again that's a place that exists already in the past, and so you keep walking down the path and you're shutting out all other possibilities, and that's why they don't happen. I don't know if you um the story of how I recently met my friends who own the farm, one of my newsletter. It's, it's actually, I want to talk about it a little bit because it is the most recent factor that changed my life, like the, the most recent shift in my life. So a little bit background, I, I told you, like I came to the island like three years ago, I kind of started this journey. One day I was talking with my boyfriend and he was just like, it doesn't make sense that we don't just grow fruit trees everywhere. Like why aren't fruit trees being grown everywhere? Like that should be our goal just to grow as many fruit trees as we can all over the world. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of how we started the whole journey of um, growing and homesteading and making content so that we can, you know, inspire more people to just grow fruit trees everywhere. So the craziest thing happened. Well, just for context, we don't actually have any idea what we're doing. We have like a couple of trees, but none of them are actually fruiting. We have like a basil that is like kind of dead. And then sometimes it's alive and then sometimes it's dead. But then a year ago, or maybe like six months ago, we went to a plant store, you know, to like buy some of the fruit trees that we have now. And it's like, why would we go to this store? Like, this is like a store that's on the other side of the island, so far away. And, you know, uh, he was just like, well, I want to buy some, like, exotic fruit trees i don't want to just grow tomatoes and basil or, you know let's grow some cool fruits and so we went there and we were at the store for like three three hours just like looking at all these things and the guy there was so passionate about what he was talking about that he kind of like pulled us in and he kind of like kept us as a store because he just like he knows so much about all these plants and we just just like we just enjoy being in his presence he's so excited talking about these things and then like right before we left this guy came in and he asked about green tea and then he went and he bought all the green tea in the store. And so I was thinking to myself, like this fucking gringo is like so weird. Like he probably has like a samurai <laughs> sword on top of his bed. Like, you know, like some weird thing with like Asia, fa- Asian fetish or something. That's why he's buying all this mm-hmm. fucking green tea. And like, you know, we started getting to talking and then he was like, oh, you know, we, uh, we have a 35 acre farm that we just bought like a year ago and we're, you know, electricity, we made all water, we pump water from our spring and, you know, we're doing all these cool things. And I was like, holy shit, this guy is like doing exactly what we want to do. And so Mm -hmm. I kind of invited myself to his farm. I was like, you have to let me come and visit. Like, I'm going back to the city today. I want to please like come and check it out. Like he gave me the address and he said, like, actually, I have more errands to run. So I won't even be there, but my wife will be there. I'll call her and let her know that you guys are coming. And we got to the farm and it's like this gorgeous, like in the mountains kind of, it's, I call it a farm, but it's not like a farm where it's just flat land everywhere. It's more like in the mountains mm-hmm. where there's like trees grow out, like overgrowing and a lot of like palm trees and giant trees, like it's more like a jungle that they are farming on. So, you know, I got there and then I met um, the wife who was like, she was carrying a freaking baby on her hand and another, and a machete on the other hand. And she's just like whacking stuff and growing stuff. And I was like, oh god like she's fucking badass and then you know we get to talking and then i found out that you know they have been homesteading for a really long time but more than that they've been um familiar with permaculture yeah i was gonna ask you about that as well on permaculture and growing food forests uh, all of that yeah 
so that so so she basically is a permaculture teacher who's been doing this for 20 years like so she knows all about it and the, and then so i asked her like can we please just come out to your farm once a week to help right because they have a huge piece of land and only a couple and a two-year-old baby and so that's kind of how we met and then we've been coming out there with them like just working with them every week once a week i just we just come out there and literally just wait for them to tell us like hey do this do that like and they teach us so mm-hmm. much and then, you know, we sleep in the jungle at night and then, you know, we help out with this stuff. And now we are kind of like um, partners because they are like super cool people, but they are not online so much. So, you know, um, Longin, my, the husband, I call him Longin, uh, cause I like to keep their names. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't like to like to say their names all over the place. So I call him Longin and he has been like building stuff. He's been an engineer. He can build like anything. And Dorian, the wife, she can grow anything like she is like so good at growing food and in a way that it's just like so efficient so they are like doing so many cool things but they actually have trouble making money because they don't know how to monetize they have the skills Mm -hmm. and they love being in nature so much that they are not even really in the digital war at all so then that's where we come in and then you know now we're like well, let us do the, all the marketing stuff for you. Let us do all the digital stuff for you. And you just teach us all this other we need to learn. And then from there, it has just been like a beautiful relationship that kind of built from there to the point now where we're trying to buy a house right next to their land. Like, you know, I, I'm a journey to like mm-hmm. buy land. And now we're just like, it doesn't make sense to live anywhere else. Like, why would we not live next to the people who know everything that we need to learn to do? And, uh, yeah, so like, anyway, the point of the story is you know, that would never have happened to me three years ago when I was so obsessed with planning my life and doing everything exactly as the way I see it. But now it's just like this thing actually happened. And finally, I can say like, oh, yeah, it does happen. Like you do meet people who could change <laughs> your life. If you just stop for a second planning your life so much, then they will be able to like come into your life for you. Yeah, that's so awesome. And I love how you guys managed to, you know, have really this win-win friendship in which you help them with the internet stuff and they help yeah. you by teaching you. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, it's it's just, it's such a, and they are just like amazing people. Like you, you meet somebody and it makes sense too because, you know, they are in nature all the time. They're just always working outside. And so they have a beautiful relationship with each other and just the way that they, they interact with you. They are so comfortable being themselves and they're just so happy. And that's kind of where I realized like even more that thing is more important than the energy that you bring into the world. And so nothing is more important than making sure that you yourself are happy, that you have found your happiness and like being around them kind of just solidifies all of that for me because I've never met anyone in my life who are just that happy, right? So like, you know, when you're around, even around my parents, you know, they're not happy. So when I'm around them, I always, you know, feel a certain way. I have to say certain things and all of my friends too. And now I finally get to be around like actual happy people. And it makes me feel great. Like, you know, like when like it, I get so much work done, it's just like, it's an awesome energy. And it's just something that we should all be working on spreading. Yeah. You start wondering why are not why, like, why isn't everyone like that, right? Right, like, actually, it's so funny because, like, most of my friends, you know, they are married and they're not happily married. <laughs> you know, they don't want this mm. fucking thing. But it's just, like, being a functional and happy relationship is not something that I am used to. I also, I grew up with, um, you know, and I remember, I, I remember that, like, the moments when my mom and my dad are actually happy together, those are the moments where I would feel so excited and so happy and I, I treasure it so much. And it's like, at the end of the day, like your kids, they don't really want much from you. You know, they don't need you to mm-hmm. put them to like private school and trust fund and all that. They just want to be in your happy moments. Like they want to be happy with you. Those are like the only moments that I remember of my mom and my dad, you know? So it, it's, and now I, I, I watched that two-year-old. She's like the smartest and just most precious baby I've ever met. And I meet a lot of babies. Like I am one of those people who go to parties and I don't talk to the adults. I just go and play with the kids outside in the backyard. Mm-hmm. Like I, so I have met a lot of kids and I hang out with a lot of kids. And she just, 
blows my mind, like her emotional intelligence, you know, her cognitive functioning, her motor, motor skill, like the way she can pick things with her hands, like how her, and her motor skill is and how, how much she can articulate her feelings and her needs and how much she understands the world that's going on around her. And she's walking me through the garden and telling me what all these plants are that I don't even know. Like she's telling me like, oh, that's Tulsi Holy Basil. And then she pick a leaf and she would eat it and she would hand it to me and she'd be like, Ava, eat whole Tulsi Basil. Like, you know, like she's doing these things and she's two years old. Like, I don't understand how, she, you know, but it's just like, now I get what it's supposed to be like, like functional relationship, functional dynamic between parents and kids. Like it exists, but it's very, very rare. It is, unfortunately. And. I think one of the reasons is just because parents, they're too busy and they don't really have time for their kids. And, and it's parents hard. are not happy. That's why, right? They're busy because they're running from something. They're running from themselves. And I think a lot of parents have this belief and it's normal because that's, you know, our society, but they have this belief that you have to be able to provide for your kids. But I think yeah. it's time that we change the definition of what we are supposed to provide for our kids. Like, I think that we're supposed to provide them, you know, a sense of safety in our presence, a sense of being heard and seen. And we're supposed to provide them happiness because if you're all you're doing is just making money and providing for your kids and sacrificing yourself for them, that's exactly what they're going to learn when they grow up. They're not going to learn how to be happy because you never were happy. So they will learn how to sacrifice themselves for the people they love. And then that cycle of, you know, mean, not, well, unnecessary sacrifice just keep going on and going on and going on. And then that's why we're also unhappy. The other thing is like, we all think we have to work hard and sacrifice for our loved ones. But that's not true because doing that is not making anybody happy. It's not making us happy. And then it's not making them happy. Yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day, the kid just wants the attention from the parents. They don't really care <laughs> just want to feel too happy. much about. Yeah, that's exactly they want what to play we all with you and, want yeah. to feel. Yeah, like, that's what we want to feel too. We just want to feel happy. But I think that we are wired to believe that we don't deserve it until we reach certain things in our life. Like you said earlier, mm -hmm. talking about um, feeling enough. I think that we don't feel enough and that's why we don't think that we deserve to be happy. Why do you think that we have that inner voice that makes us not feel like we deserve things or like you wrote about as well about, oh, you're too idealistic or you're being unrealistic. Why do you think we have that inner voice? That inner voice is a reflection of our outside environment. That's where it comes from. It comes from society. It comes from our parents not feeling that they were enough. So then they pass that on to us. Obviously not intentionally, but you know, children pick up more than just what you teach them. They pick up your body language. They pick up your beliefs. They pick up, you know, your subconscious. And that's where it comes from. It's just generations of feeling that way because I think it is because we were not yet there in our evolution. I think now we are aware of the inner voice because that's the next step of our evolution. The first thing we needed to do was dominating the physical world. And I think that we have achieved that. But every step that lead up to that, nothing else mattered except for dominating the physical world. And now we have dominated the physical world and now we are looking to enter the spiritual world, like the world of more meaning and more fulfillment. And so the the... The inner voice that we get is really just the um, lingering part of our previous step in human evolution of money in the physical world and never feel like it's enough because how do you create enough? How do you have enough rockets? How do you have buildings? How do you have enough technology? They can always be faster and better. The physical world, there is never going to be the point where you reach the point. It's like, oh, yeah, everything is enough. And so I think that's where that voice comes from. It's just the lingering part of our past, you know, always trying to get more and more, you know, security, more technology. We always want to reach more so that we can dominate this world. And that is where internally we also feel like we have to reach a certain point in order for us to feel enough. But now as we walk towards the next step in our evolution, I think it's very exciting in that you mentioned it's like so many people are talking about homesteading and moving out. Like that's all part of it. 
but as we reach that next step now we have to un we have to unlearn and we have to shed all the things that we kind of have picked up along the way that we have ignored for a long time because we have mm-hmm. this total vision of like oh physical work physical work more stuff better stuff and so we ignore everything else that's there and now we start to realizing okay well now we did all that so let's go back and realize what we picked up that's not serving us and let let's solve that let's let that go let's figure out how to you know not feel like that anymore so we can move up move forward i think every everything that we are going through right now um politics war in the outside environment as well as within ourselves i think this is just a part of our evolution this is how we're this is what we're supposed to experience and it's so exciting that we get to experience it especially at like mm-hmm. an age where we still have a lot of juice in us to you know to keep going and keep seeing where this mm-hmm. thing goes like yeah how was the transition for you from becoming a dentist and then the crypto stuff and then deciding to move to the island and being with Ray as well because you you were not alone in that so how was that all for you it's so crazy like you're so fucking crazy it's like the best thing but it doesn't present itself as the best thing in the moment so like when I was going through it it was really shitty a lot of it especially like well not okay so let's back up so I got into crypto and I was graduating then I get really into it where I was just like nothing else matter like everything is fake I think that's <laughs> actually where the first that was my first like waking up moment realizing like all of these um that I believed was true context right Bef- before crypto I believed that everything that you know America is doing is right. It is a number one country. It cannot be malicious. It might have some problems, but mm. it's not mountain ten. Like I was all bought into all of that, right? Because I come from a third world country. So the, the land where I accomplish all these things, the place where it gives me all the opportunity to reach and find the level of success that I found. Like I was very proud about that. I was very patriotic. Like that's who I was. And then I got into crypto and then, you know, like fucking crypto Twitter just like broke all of that for me. Like all, all the fucking conspiracies and all the rabbit holes that I went down. I was like, what the fuck? It's all a lie. And, you know, I went through like the other extreme end of the spectrum. So it itself was like really crazy. Like there was also many moments of like feeling angry feeling uh, dark like uh, I'm in the dark because everything was fake and so now like where is the light it was very confusing and I was yeah I was angry for a lot of it then you know moving to the island was also part of that it's just kind of feeling so overwhelmed with the guess the life that I have built that now I kind of couldn't stand it anymore because I'm like I've worked like 20 years for this now this implies that it's just like all a lie and I kind of had the need to like just you know start to have a reset I needed a reset I needed to move away somewhere where I wasn't constantly in the environment that you know I felt like I was trapped in so that was fun when I moved to the island it was like a new world opening up you know um, free mangoes free coconut a surfing a lot of smoking weed didn't really have to worry about anything <laughs> because it was like shortly after I just quit my job. So I didn't have a job, but I had like a doctorate degree to make me feel like I'm not, you know, for mm-hmm. nothing. I felt like, oh, yeah, just, you know, I have, I'm a doctor. I feel good about myself. It's okay for me to like take a break and have no job and smoke weed every fucking day. And, and so I did that for a while. <laughs> and then that's all of my money in crypto. That was very interesting because that's when like it all came crashing down because my whole life, my self-worth has all been tied to how much money that I had, how much money that I was making. Like my bank account was the thing that helps me go to sleep at night. And so when I lost all that money, that was like a very, very traumatic and um, weird experience, especially when I had just quit my job. I kind of had to like, to to the point where after six months, so if I don't practice, dentistry for six months and I would have to go and get my license all over again in order to get my job back 
So it wasn't just like, oh, quit my job. I can just go back whenever I need money. Like I technically couldn't go back to work anymore unless I fucking take like the board again. And I don't, I don't want to do that. And so, you know, when I lost all my money, it has passed that six months mark. And so I was like, what the fuck am I going to do now? And, you know, it was, it, it was also very um, scary because um, I moved out there. I was making a lot of money in crypto. So I was like living large, like it was, mm. it was fucking like note season. It was all coin season. It was like every season season. So like, you know, you throw money here and it just fucking grow. You throw money there and it's fucking grow. And I had this like, um, superiority complex where I was like, oh, I'm so stupid. Why are they working? Like you can just buy a note and you never have to work again. <laughs> so, you know, to like crash from that high. And go down to like everything is worth nothing and you have no job. It was such a big fucking crash that I think my entire identity just like disintegrated. Like I had no idea who I was anymore. You know, I, I couldn't even face my friends. I could face my family. And actually, I rented a very expensive apartment when I came out to the island because I had the money. And then, you know, I lost mm-hmm. all my money and I couldn't afford that apartment anymore. Actually, I had to move back home to the States to live with my mom and stay in her basement. That was a very, very interesting time because I was just figuring out, like, it was so much more than just, like, what do I do next to make money? It was just also, like, what am I doing with my life? Who am I? What do I believe in? Why have I gotten myself to this position? Like, you know, like, all kind of existential crisis stuff. And that's also the time when I did shroom for the very first time. And that's like an interesting story <laughs> too. But I think that's kind of what started the path for me to like get here. I think that's kind of the case for a lot of people is they hit a point in the physical world where everything is so unpleasant and so dark that the ego snap. And and the, basically the ego kind of just like couldn't handle it anymore. Like you, your, your ego is so hurt that higher self has to come in and rescue it it's for me that's what happened was my ego was so hurt and so bruised up and you know it was like a fucking raisin and then my higher self kind of had to come in and be like hey there has to be a higher purpose for us than this like there has to be a reason all of this is happening and that was kind of like the voice that guide me out of like the dark and then from there I became a community manager for an NFT project, make some money. And then when I was doing that, that's kind of what got me started with the whole making content thing, because I was giving them with a, getting a lot and I was making a lot of content. And that's how I got into working with Photoshop, with Premiere Pro, with Canva. And then so after that job was over, it just, you know, I picked up those skills, I take those skills more seriously. And then that's when I wanted to build a brand on Twitter. Then doing that, I start realizing that a lot of people don't know how to build a brand. So then I started a company that helps people, like help small business entrepreneurs who have, you know, products that I believe in, help them build a brand. So then I, I, I was doing that for maybe like a year. I was making good money, but then I realized once again that I was being pulled by money that I didn't really enjoy the work that I was doing anymore. It wasn't meaningful for me. And then that's when I just like kind of just dropped all of my clients and forgot about the company and kind of just went like completely jobless again. But this time I just, you know, I have gone through so much of like discovering who I am and what I want to do that the second time I went jobless, I just don't have that fear and that anxiety anymore. That's not true. Sometimes I still do, but it's like a 1%, 99%. I know that this is what I want and I will get there. It might take time. It might be hard, but I'm going to get there. You know, that's basically how it led to uh, more time to grow stuff, to having time to go camping, to having time to go to that plant store, to meeting Longkin and Durian and now, you know, working on their farm and having all these opportunities to work with them. So it's it's all just been like a crazy and incredible journey that I don't even I don't know what I did to deserve it. Honestly, it's just it's just so amazing to stick through it. And I think that it's out there for all of us to experience. 
if we just allow ourselves to, you know, experience it and not say, that, oh, this is like, this is not right. Like there are so many times when I think that it is not right and I want to revert back to the old ways of doing things. But luckily I didn't. And I think that's all that we have to do is just stick it out. Just keep letting life, just keep showing up and then eventually life will show up and surprise you the best possible way. Yeah, it's awesome how you went through the whole hero journey. It's like a movie. You, okay, you start yeah, as know. Yeah, you start as that teenager who wants to go to Wall Street and wear high heels and then <laughs> you become a dentist and then you get rich with crypto but then you lose everything <laughs> so you break your ego and then you're like, "Oh, what do I do now?" and then you find some stuff that you might want to do with yeah. the new company. But then you figure out, no, I actually don't want to do it. So now you're on that other arc, like the second arc of the movie. So I think it's it's a wonderful story, really. I think um, that's what I'm really passionate about. That, like you can see in all of my content, I'm just really passionate about just getting people to go out there and live their hero's journey. Everybody has a hero's journey that's waiting to be lived. And, you know, we just kind of put ourselves this box and the voices of the people that we know, like in our life, they kind of like the weight that sit on top of the box and we can't break out of it. And it's so heavy. And that's why for me, like moving to the island was the best thing I could do because that kind of how I just turned that box the other side, pull all that shit out. And the box really opened up because I moved away from the environment that I realized was keeping me it's awesome, Ava. After all of this, what's your definition of success today? And how do you think it changed through your life with all of this that you lived? Uh, my definition of success today is to be happy. To be happy with where I am and to be comfortable in my own body. And for me, I mean, it looks different for everyone. But for me, like there are certain things like, when I'm in a social situation, like for example, I always feel the need to feel the silence or I feel the need to make jokes and make people laugh. Like the, just, just those little things for me is something that I want to work on because I want to be more comfortable with silence and I want to know, to, to feel that I am enough. If I feel like, if I don't feel like talking, if I'm tired, then I should just be able to sit back and let people talk and that should be totally okay. You know, like, to, so like, to feel comfortable in my skin in those small ways, but is like so present in my life every single day. That to me and feeling that where I am right now is, is enough. Like feeling enough to me, that's the definition of success. And I think that when I am creating content from that place, content is very, is much better. Like my content carries the energy of that feeling of, of that, that will transfer to my readers but a lot of time you know i still have the same fucking struggle as everybody else like oh shit like why is my stuff not getting more views why am i not getting more followers why am i not fucking going up already like you know i live with that like mm -hmm. all the time too so to me really success is to not have to live with that anymore like success is just to be able to do what i love doing without any of the stress feeling like I need to prove myself to anybody. I need to be more than who I am right now. Uh, that is, to me, a success. And I believe that that's how I can become a person that I can be a um, person that will bring the best type of energy into the world is when I can reach that place. Just being truly happy and truly comfortable. And that's what I want to do. That's awesome, Ava. I... Thank you. Yeah, I agree that just being able to accept yourself enough that you are comfortable like just being in silence and I'm not here to entertain other people. <laughs> I think that's a big hum. Yeah. And for people like us especially, I think. Yeah. You're an only child? Being... No, I'm a... I have a small, a small sister. But, you know, I think people that always grew up being like the smart kid that went well in school and that kind of thing, you kind of get that sense of you need sure. to be accomplishing something <laughs> to, to yeah. become, yeah, you always have that yeah. pressure to be doing something because like you learned that the only way you got compliments was 
by like achieving. Yeah, exactly. Like you always feel like you need to get that gratification of getting a good grade of that gratification of being on the top of your class and, you know, doing well and being praised for being so smart. Like, yeah, I am like stuck with that thing for a really long time. And I'm working on, you know, obviously just like resolving that. And I think um, me, I just want to be able to success for me is probably just seeing that being right here, success, like in, it's fucking amazing. Like we're doing a lot of amazing things. Just think about like, mm -hmm. eating. like you know, you eat a food and then what? You don't even have to think about where that food is going to go. And yet somehow it's going to help you grow and it's going to help you do all these amazing things. Like I should be able to look at that and say that that's successful. I should be able to look at the amazing things that my body does for me and realize that that's success. I mean, I have my health. I have my you know, I have so many good things going on for me and success for me is just to realize that I don't have to chase anything else, that I should just be happy here. But obviously, you know, so easy to say, so hard to do, so much fucking practice. So weird, right? It's like, we all know what will make us happy. Why can't we do it? I think we kind of get in our own way a lot of the time. So learning how to get out of your way is one of the most important things. Yeah, I think I think that's what it is. And it's just again, it's just the whole experience. I think that's why we're here to, you know, experience it. Huh? Yeah, like you talked before about like Buddhism and like coming back and maybe we're here, like we have to up we have to experience those ups and downs because mm -hmm. that's, we are here for a reason and maybe that's the reason actually. Yeah. yeah. I think so. I think that we're all here just to have this amazing experience and we need to stop worrying so much about the bad things so that we don't compromise, you know, our short experience, like our literal one second on a cosmic timeline. Like we have one mm -hmm. second. That's all we have compared to how long the world, like the earth or, you know, space or the star yeah. has been around. We have one fucking second. Like let's really able to enjoy that second. Not even every yeah, second, and, just that one second. And uh, are you really going to waste that one second, like being stressed out about everything, yeah, or exactly. are you going to be able to enjoy it? Like it's and, like none of that is even real. Like it, it's not real. If you think about like, like if you remove yourself from everything right now and you just go into like a remote fucking mountain in a cave somewhere. And just sit and experience the rest of your life in that cave. Thing out here is going to change. So all of the sense of like responsibility and ambitions and like expectation and all of that, all of that is not real. It's we believe that it's real because we were told that it was real, but it's really not. Like if you like gave like if tomorrow you decided you go in a cave, like I will miss you for like a couple of minutes, and then it's gonna be like, well, nothing about my life is gonna change. I mean, people who are in your life, their life might suck for a little bit but then they still carry on and they still keep living and then they will enter a new reality where you don't exist anymore and so you know to give ourselves that freedom to realize that it's okay for you to do nothing because nothing bad is really going to happen like just having that freedom I think is like, like it's, it's a gift that you gotta give yourself and I think it's from that place of freedom that you go on to accomplish amazing things that you can't even imagine I think we could go so deep with what you just said <laughs> about going to the mountains or the caves and yeah. impermanence and before? how people, yeah, how people would forget about you in a heartbeat and yeah, but yeah, I, I don't want to like take your whole day today, but yeah, I think that would be a great start to a next episode that we could do sometime. <laughs> For sure. I'm always there. I love talking to you. You are such a great host and speaker. Like, I always say this. This Actually, that was the reason why I hit you up that one time asking you about a job that I was working on. If you wanted, like, to do it, I was just like, he's a really good speaker and, like, he has a really good um demeanor to, I to like, that. the way that you do things. So, yeah, I enjoyed every minute of this conversation. It's really fun. Yeah, me too. Do you have anything that you like to add, like 
anything else you wanted to talk about and we didn't touch upon? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think that, you know, we've, we've talked about a lot of it. Uh, I would be curious how, how you're feeling on your journey. This whole, um, I really like this rock and roll thing that you're doing. I check out your YouTube and it looks great. You're just certainly putting in the work. So how's that going for you? Yeah, I think the best part about it is, you know, kind of making a log for myself. Because now that I started putting some videos when I go somewhere and and also talking to great people like yourself, it's so cool that I can imagine like 10 years from now, I'll be able to look at this era in my <laughs> life and I'll be able to see all of that. And I wish I could do that in the past if I could go 10, 15 years ago and be able mm -hmm. to see it as well. So in a way, I kind of, you know, I'm building for the long term, like, so my children can maybe instead of think or like what would my dad think about certain things like they can just watch a video <laughs> and they have it all over there and like my dad was an idiot when he was pretty that's awesome that is a really good way to look at it like you're doing it for yourself and for your family and it's just yeah it's, it is a log of memory it's, it's just making memories and I think that uh, especially for myself being like content creator trying to make content because I want to put my message out there I think I worry too much about how many people it reaches but I don't think about mm -hmm. like you know if just one person like in my life that came to me and say hey I saw your stuff and it really changed my life it was amazing like if just one person said that to me that would be like that is success like that is a huge success and so you know I think that's also another thing that I'm working on is stop thinking that I need to hit any numbers at all to like feel like what I'm doing is you know is it's worth it or it's impactful like I should focus on doing it for myself and for you know just memory capsule to look back later yeah totally and you know that's one of the main reasons that I started doing some stuff in Portuguese as well because I started doing things just in English because I wanted to target like an American crowd because they have more money and I could sell them something, <laughs> yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, that consumer is easier to sell them stuff. Yeah, and they have a lot of disposable income to sell stuff to. And But at the end of the day, like most of the people that I like in my life, they don't really speak English or the ones mm. that do, like most speak just Portuguese. So I started doing these videos and it's so cool. Like today, my aunt, she said, oh, I saw your video on A-B testing. That's so cool. Like she'd never heard of it. And it's a video with like 37 views and she's one of them and she liked it uh, and she so talked cool. to me about it. So yeah, so it's like, it's cool to see people and like who you actually know and they come to you and talk about something and like they watch the 30 minute video of you talking to yourself. So that that's much uh, cooler than like just, you know, if just go, oh, I got a thousand views from random people that didn't even comment anything. So you don't even, <laughs> I think this is, what do you think about that in the creator yeah. journey? It's very lonely sometimes because mm -hmm. you put your heart out, you're writing that thing, you're putting that video, but then you get like 10 likes. But <laughs> likes don't like, mean anything really. Hundreds of views and not even a like. Like if I get a like, I'll be happy. A lot of my stuff, you know, like a lot of the newsletters that I write, like sometimes I just get no like, like a hundred views and no like. And that kind of, you know, anytime there's a voice like a hundred people saw that and nobody liked it. You fucking suck. Like, you know, like, like that. But yeah, like I, I agree. Like I need to adopt more of your perspective of just like doing it for for my it's one thing that I'm not doing is like I'm not telling anybody in my life that I'm doing what I'm doing online so that's kind of like I, so I don't know how does how does do you tell your family and stuff like do you give them the links or like how do they find you yeah I don't tell everyone in my life but like the closer like my closest family and closest friends I send them some links not all the okay. links because okay. if I did send everything I think it would be overwhelming. I do too much stuff to, but like every three, four videos, I, I'll send a link or something. The I link will take them to, to my the parents place. And all. But, but the link yeah. will take them to the place where they can find all your stuff, right? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> okay. See, I yeah, don't have the I'll, I'll send it to, to a YouTube that. or something. 
people have like they don't even know about meditating mango. They don't even they don't know that I exist in this version of you, me that you're talking to. Like they don't know. I you should let them know at least maybe I your cousins know. they could get inspired, you know. Uh, you could well, inspire intern, your cousins and my young cousin, he does know, but he doesn't care. Like, you know, they're Gen Z, they fucking watch this shit on TikTok. They don't really look at my stuff. Like, they don't read. I can't get them to read a newsletter. Like, they don't read something that long. They have no attention span. What about the videos? I don't know. I just don't share it with them. Uh, yeah, I, I get. I know what you mean. Like, that's so one still, of the great. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just feel like I'm still not at the place where I'm consistently doing it and sure of what I'm doing. So maybe that's also another thing that I want to overcome because like with my videos, it had only been like maybe like a month that I have been able to consistently schedule like a video every day. Like I like to stay consistent because when I don't, then I won't get it done. And that has been like, I have tried to do video content for a very long time, but I just keep falling off all the wagon. Like I would do like five, six, and then I fall off and I stop for like six months and so I think that's mm-hmm. why I don't want to tell anybody until I reach a point of like, oh, yeah, it's automatic now. Every day there's a video coming out. I don't want to have to think about it. Yeah. No, I totally get you. That's why I don't even edit my videos, actually, because really? it, it would be a bit overwhelming to like, yeah. I have a lot of ideas of cool things that I could do. But just by thinking of the work, because I, I mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to hire an editor at this point mm-hmm. in time. So just by thinking of all the work that it would take. I just do it like talking head videos or something because yeah. they're easier to do. And about that that you said, you know, that's one of the greatest reasons as well that I started in English because people wouldn't understand anything. Yeah. So now one year later, I'm much more confident about doing stuff. So I think, yeah, yeah you it's like a muscle that you develop as well. That's one of the cool thing about creating content that I didn't expect to happen. It just how much more comfortable we are putting ourselves out there. Like, do you feel like that's what you got out of this totally, whole thing? Totally. Yeah. yeah. When I was in uh, school, like before I did, I started all this when I was like in school and working, I was just like, I, I would like get these random thoughts that kind of run into like a rant that I would record or I would write down. And then I would think so much about if I should share it or not. And then I just end up never sharing them. Like, you know, I would never post it on like my personal Instagram because I'm like, oh, you worry so much about how people will receive it or if you even come up right. And there's always the need to come up like the way that you think that you should come up. But now mm-hmm. like I get this freedom of just like, okay, sometimes I'm going to say something wrong. Sometimes I'm going to be totally fucking inappropriate. And sometimes I'm just going to look so bad and that's okay. Like, it's completely okay for us to be those things in like, you don't have to be good all the time. We don't have to be perfect. Like that's like the freedom that I got out of this whole journey that I'm so appreciative for. It's just like putting myself out there. Like now when I'm around my friends, I'm more comfortable just saying what I think because at the end of the day, if I could do it for strangers, then, you know, I, I'm much more comfortable doing it around my family and my friends. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And there were so many job interviews that, they told you, you know, you need to send a video and that kind of thing. And so many that I didn't send the video. So doing this, like it helped me so much, like improving with public speaking and not caring that much what people will think. So I think it's a journey that it it's worth it. Even if you don't think about like making money or anything, like just the journey itself, it's worth it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I really, you know, when I started, I had this, um, I guess kind of like, aim of calling myself mm-hmm. like a content creator because you know how they're like oh my god those influencers are so yeah, stupid yeah. like you're making content like so many content out there already why do you need to make more content you know and i always feel I don't call myself that either <laughs> well you should because that's what you're doing <laughs> yeah it's just like yeah there's so many content out there but most of them have you seen them you say it yourself they fucking suck so what are you gonna do about it are you just like keep complaining and then watch the same shitty content or are you going to go and make some content that's actually cool? Like, why don't you go make something before you sit there and complain about, you know, the amount of content that sucks out there? And so now it's just like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I totally don't care. Like, I believe in what I'm doing. I enjoy what I'm doing. 
I no longer have that feeling of like, oh, I don't want to say content creator. That's so cringe. Like, <laughs> it's only cringe if you cringe at it, but I don't cringe at it. So I don't think it's cringe. And that's something that I think also is really cool. It's just like, this is the first thing that I have stuck to doing so long. It is like outside of dentistry. Like besides pursuing dentistry, I have never, ever been able to stick to anything. And that's why I'm not good at anything. Like I don't have any specific well, I can't even play an instrument. I can't really, I, I try so many things like instrument, martial arts, like sports, everything. I have never been able to stick to doing something to the point where I become good at it. So I have like no talent, but this is something I've been sticking to for a while. And I'm really glad that I did. It's so much fun. Yeah. I think you're underselling yourself a little bit. When I say talent, I mean like I can't. Like, like tricks, like you can play the guitar, right? Play music. Yeah. I've always wanted to play like the guitar or the, the piano and I've tried them and I've bought them and I just like never able to stick through with it. And it was the same thing with me trying to learn to chisu, me surfing, me, uh, mountain climbing. There's, I just, I just have a hard time sticking to stuff. So like, I am actually really <laughs> proud of myself that I can stick to this for this long. Yeah. And where can people find you? Anyone that's watching, where can they find YouTube you? YouTube channel, Meditating Mangles. See where the link will pop up. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll leave all of the links in the yeah. description. And... Yeah, just, uh, I think I think right now I would like, like to drive traffic mostly to my YouTube channel unless they are looking for my newsletter. But I don't know that many people who particularly to sign up to a newsletter unless that's like the thing that they're trying to build themselves. Like on Substack, most of the people that are like following me are also people who are building a newsletter. And that's like most of my audience. Yeah, people that's are... true. I think Substack is very much a, a social media for writers. Yeah. So it's like everyone's <laughs> writing there. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And then, like, and like if you want to, mm -hmm. yeah, if you want to sell something, maybe something like Beehive might be better. But yeah. I yeah. think that if you like to read and you like reading things that come from the bottom of the heart and very raw, unapologetic, you should take a look at Meditating Mangoes because <laughs> it's yeah. it's very cool. I I always compliment Ava on her writing. So if you're still watching this. You liked it, so you'll like it as well. Just still watching this after two hours and 12 minutes. You should definitely subscribe to me. <laughs> yeah, you're probably Ava's mom or something, so <laughs> you should definitely take a look. So my mom does not know that I exist in this digital world. <laughs> you're probably just a stalker somewhere out there. But yeah, subscribe to my channel then. <laughs> well... Do you think she should be proud? I don't think so. She wants me to go back to becoming a dentist so that she can tell all her friends that her daughter is a doctor. She doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't understand. She doesn't understand what I'm doing. She's always like, you know, I work so hard so that you don't have to do all of this stuff. Why are you doing this? Like, she just doesn't get it. But I think she sees that I'm happier now. And so she, you know, I make a joke that she's disappointed in me, but I, you know, it's it's really just a joke. I think that now she sees that I'm happy and she's more just like, yeah, whatever. I don't understand it, but she's happy. So she just do her thing. Well, uh, you know, when, when we get into these conversations, she still kind of like show her like resistance to and how like she just doesn't get it. Like, I don't understand what the fuck you're doing, but. <laughs> That's okay because I think that if we're doing things that our parents understand, then we're not out of the box enough. Because, you know, how are you going to evolve when you're just doing the same thing that your parents have been doing for, like, their whole life? Yeah, that's awesome. Ava, thank you so much. I had so much fun recording with you. This was awesome. Yeah, this was so much fun. This is, like, the best interview I've had. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, best of luck to you. Thank you for watching Rock and Roll Success. I hope you liked the episode with Ava. I had a lot of fun talking to her. I hope to have her back soon. And if you like this, you'll love the next episode that I'm going to leave over here for you to watch.